So the, the next witness is Mr. Hugh Grant, please. I, Hugh Grant, do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Mr Grant, your, your full name please. Uh, Hugh John Mungo Grant. Mr Grant, we've prepared a bundle for you and you'll find please under tab one your first witness statement which is dated and signed by you with a statement of truth on the 3rd of November of this year. I invite you to take that to hand, please, and confirm that that is your first statement. It is. Uh, and then you gave a second statement, a supplementary witness statement, on the 11th of November, and again there was a statement of truth. Yes. Now, what I'm going to do, Mr. Well, Grant... Just before you do anything, yes. um, Mr. Grant, as with some of the other... Uh, witnesses, I'm very grateful to you for coming. I am extremely conscious that uh, you are speaking about matters which you would prefer were not deployed in the press and that that is a difficult decision and a difficult experience for you. I'm conscious of it and I'm grateful to you for, for, for assisting the inquiry with your evidence. During the course of the afternoon we're likely to have a break but if at any stage you feel that um, you want just a, a few minutes off. You don't have to say cut. It's sufficient <laughs> if you indicate it, and I'll be pleased to, um, okay. to uh, uh, accord you that uh, time. Thank you very much. So we're not time limited, Mr. Grant. We've got the, the whole oh, afternoon. I'm we, sorry to hear that. We may be short. <laughs> you, your evidence subdivides, if I may say so, into evidence of fact and evidence of opinion. Mm. I'd like to start, please, with the evidence of, of fact. Do you follow me before we move on yeah. to to the opinions. And in, in relation to your career, every, everybody of course um, probably knows all about your career, but you, you made it big, if I can so describe it, with a film in 1994, <laughs> Four Weddings and a Funeral, but though you don't say so yourself, you did rather well, I think, with another film which some of us enjoyed in 1987 called, called Maurice, so it wasn't as if it's a, a one-off, and then your career took off there, thereafter. <laughs> Um, you say in your statement that following the success of Four Weddings and a Funeral in 1994, initially the, the press comment was, was favourable and then, it, as it were, plummeted. Can you tell us a bit about the favourable part, the, the good part, if we can so describe it in your own words, please? Uh, well, it was, it was fairly brief, but of, of course on the back of that the success of Four Weddings and a Funeral, yes. um, yeah, there was a spirit of, of goodwill. I mean, I think, you know... The nation liked having a, a film that was making, that was popular and, and funny and doing very well all over the world. You know, we enjoy the, the few uh, British cinema successes we get, and uh, I got a little um, blip of positive press on the, on the back of that. Yes. Yeah. And, and at that stage, was there any interest in your private life, do you think? Uh, there was a great deal um, of interest suddenly in my private life. Yes particularly beginning at the premiere of that film, uh, when the press became very interested in, in me and my girlfriend. Yes. OK, well, well I, think, I think we probably remember that, that, that premiere. Um, can I move on, however, to um, perhaps the, the darker side, and, and this is paragraph seven of your, your witness <coughs> statement. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to cover the events of July 1995. We're, we're not interested in that. Well, but, I, I wish you would, in a way. Okay. Um, simply because... If, am I allowed to break in of on Of course, it? yes. Well, just because I think it's an important point that I make in this statement, that um, all the uh, question, questioning and campaigning I've done recently about uh, what I see as the abuses of some sections of the uh, British press is emphatically not motivated by the treatment I got when I was arrested in 1995. I say in my statement here, I, I was arrested, it was a pu on public record, I totally expected there to be tons of press, a press storm, that happened, and I have no quarrel with it, none whatsoever, and uh, I, I think it's important to make that point. Fair enough. Yeah. 
But there, there, there was an incident involving a, a break into your, your London flat, which yes. was on the fourth, fourth floor. Yeah. And the, the front door was forced off its, its hinges. Uh, it sounds as if it was sort of very professionally done, but there was, there was no damage inside the flat. Is that correct? No damage and nothing was stolen. Yes. This came at the uh, zenith of the sort of press storm around that, that arrest in Los Angeles. I was now back in London, uh, holed up in my flat, uh, and I'd managed to get out for the day, and, or the night, I can't remember. Anyway, when I came back, this flat had been broken into. The, the front door had been uh, basically just shoved off its hinges. And as I say, nothing was stolen, which was weird. Uh, and the police, nevertheless, came around the next day to talk about it. And the day after that, uh, a detailed account of what the interior of my flat looked like appeared in one of the British tabloid papers. I, I can't remember which one at the moment, mm. but it was, it was definitely there. And I remember thinking, uh, who told them that? Was that the burglar yes. or was that the police? And when I told this story to Tom Watson recently, the MP who was writing a book about this kind of thing, mm. uh, he nodded knowingly saying, oh yes, that particular method of break-in I've come across with several other people who are victims of um, a lot of, or in the crosshairs of a lot of oppressed tension. Uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to have been a singular occasion. And I, you know, it's, it's doubly sinister to me because that flat, as you said, is a, you have to walk up a hell of a lot of stairs to get there. I would think it was a very bad choice for a normal burglar. And nothing was stolen. And I've had it for 25 years and it's never been broken into before or since. In, in terms of the, the logical possibilities, I, I, I suppose it's either, in no particular order, a leak from the police, or it might be the burglar was acting on the instructions of the press to gain sight of the inside of your flat. But we don't know which hypothesis is the correct one. Do well, we? it, or both. Or both. Yeah. I think the most likely scenario is both. Mm. Or, alternatively, a burglar who's found whose flat is bur burgled and decided that here's somewhere he can make some money. Yes. Whatever. Yes. I'm not... Fine. Fine. But they were very... I mean, you know, this was at a time when there were a lot of press outside all the time, desperate to get in. It was mm. the middle of the summer, and I, I know they were, they were listening. You know, it was right up, four, four floors up, and they, they could actually hear one or two of the rows I was having at the time. And so I know they were desperate to, to get some kind of access. Now, paragraph 8 and following, you deal with various libel actions, um, all of which um, were successful. Can you, can you assist us, please, with a general idea of, of how many libel claims we were talking about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's been 16, 17 years since before weddings, since I became of any kind of interest to the tabloid press, and I would imagine in those 17 years, I don't know, uh, half a dozen, maybe more, maybe, maybe 10, uh, I've got my lawyers over there, you can ask him, he'd know. Yes. Uh, but um, I've just mentioned two here uh, out of those because it would be very boring to go through them all. And, and um, in themselves, they're not significant, but uh, these p two particular examples, I think, are significant. Yes. The example you give in paragraph 11, February 2007... The plummy-voiced woman issue. Mm. Um, are you suggesting there that the that story must have come from phone hacking? Well, what I say in this paragraph is that the Mail on Sunday ran an article, February 2007, saying that my relationship with my then girlfriend Jemima Khan was on the rocks because mm -hmm. of my persistent late-night flirtatious phone calls with a plummy-voiced studio executive from Warner Brothers. Mm. And it was a bizarre story, completely untrue, that uh, I sued for libel over and, and won and um, uh, damages rewarded, a statement was made in open court. But I, thinking about how they could possibly come up with such a bizarre left-field story I realized that although there was no uh, plummy-voiced studio executive from Warner Brothers with whom I'd had any kind of relationship, flirtatious or otherwise, there was a great friend of mine in Los Angeles who uh, runs a production company which is associated with Warner Brothers and whose assistant, he's a charming, married, middle-aged lady, English, 
who, uh, as happens in Hollywood, is the person who rings you. The, the executive never rings you. It's always their assistant. Hi, we have, you know, Jack Bailey on the phone for you. And this was what she used to do. She used to call and she used to leave messages and because she was a nice English girl living in L.A., um, sometimes when we spoke, we'd have a joke about English stuff, Marmite or whatever. And so she would leave charming, uh, jokey messages saying, please call mm. uh, the studio executive back. And she has a voice that could only be described as plummy. So... I cannot, for the life of me, think of any conceivable source for this story in the, in the Mail on Sunday except those voice messages on my mobile telephone. Well, you haven't, um, you haven't alleged that before, have you, in the public domain? Story? No, but when I was um, preparing this statement and going through all my old trials and tribulations of the press, I looked at that one again, I thought, that is weird, and then the penny dropped. Hmm. I think the, the hardest it can be... Well, frankly, it's a piece of speculation on your part, isn't it, in relation to this? Uh, yeah, you could be uh, speculation, okay, but I would love to um, know. I mean, I think Mr. Kaplan, who represents Associated, was saying earlier today that, you know, he'd like to put in a supplementary statement and, you know, referring to the things I say today. Well, I'd love to hear what the Daily Mail's or the Sunday Mail's explanation for that article was, what their source was, if it wasn't phone hacking. Okay, well, I may, I may come back to that, but I'll, I'll leave it there for the time being. Your, your, the next article you refer to is in paragraph 12 of your, your statement, which um, is one in the Sunday Express. And, and the point about this article, uh, and we've got it in, in HG1 on the internal numbering at page 3, but on the numbering at the bottom right-hand side, a number ending 1921, is that this article was entirely untrue. Uh, yeah, it's an article that purported to be written by me, and which I hadn't written, yes. and nor had I done that thing that, you know, happens a lot in papers where you, it's someone talking to someone. I hadn't even spoken to a journalist. It was completely, uh, as far as I could see, uh, either made up or patched and paste from, pasted from previous quotations I might have given in interviews. Right. And that is why, the, 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 as I recall, the Express lost their case and had to apologise again. The, the statement in open court makes precisely that, that point, that you did not contribute to the article in any way, and the, the Express ad admitted that. Mm. Well, they, they, those are two examples of, of defamation claims. You, you also provide examples of privacy claims. Mm. And the first one of these um, over which there was, there was litigation was um, paragraph 13 of your witness statement, a, a visit to Charing Cross Hospital. Yeah. The details of which it's, it's probably unnecessary to, to go into, but it did, it did culminate in a claim against the Mirror for breach of confidence, and you got judgment from Mr Justice Wright, that's correct, isn't yeah. it? You also um, complained to the, to the PCC, um, and that claim was upheld, was it not? Yes, uh, finally, but yes. after a, a lot of effort. I mean, it took months and months. They were very reluctant to do anything. Finally, I, I got a, a tiny recognition that my complaint had been upheld deep in the newspaper, right. without referring to what the complaint was about. Right. Can I, can I take that in stages? The, the PCC adjudication you will have in the bundle we prepared for you under tab for that bundle, if you could turn it up, please. All right. It will take me hours, but won't it? It, it, it won't. Oh, tab four. Okay, I see. There's a tab. There's only one document under tab four. Okay. <coughs> yeah. They, they upheld the privacy complaint. They, they noted, you'll see in the second paragraph, the complainant also raised a number of issues arising from the complaint involving confidentiality and the sources of information which were outside the Commission's remit. And then the Commission at the bottom regretted the delay, but uh, that was to do with, as it were, resolving issues of jurisdiction. So, r rightly or wrongly, I don't think it's going to be po possible for us to go into this. There, there were questions raised as to whether your complaint fell within the remit of the PCC. It took them time to resolve those questions, and once they resolved the questions, they upheld that part of the complaint which they felt they could deal with. Do you understand that? 
I understand that that's what they wrote. Yes. But it, it is, I fail entirely to understand how an individual's medical records being appropriated and printed for commercial profit could not come under the remit of the PCC. Yes. If that doesn't come under the remit of the PCC, what the hell is the PCC no, for? They were saying it did. It yeah, but why did it take matters, them so long? Uh, other matters they were saying, they don't identify what those matters were, well, in their view, outside the remit, but your essential complaint, and you can see that in the first paragraph of the adjudication, confidential medical information about you was published, yeah. that's the complaint they eventually focused on and they upheld it. Do you follow that? We don't know from this document the date of this uh, adjudication. You, you, everybody agrees it took a long while. You've said it. Uh, I can't agree it. Mm -hmm. You've said it took a long time, but do you know the date? Do you remember approximately how long it took? The date isn't on it. Uh, do, uh, I, my recollection is that it's about three months. But, uh, right. uh, you but have, uh, doubtless somebody will be able to tell us yes. at some stage. Yes. Don't worry about it. Okay. There's, a, there's, there's another similar complaint, or, or rather issue, and you touch on this in paragraph 15 of your statement. It's much more recent. It involves a, a, a visit to the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in March of this year. Yeah. But f first of all, Mr Grant, are, are you happy that, that we, we talk about that today? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have put it in the statement. Fair the, the article itself is at... Um, under HG1, on the internal number, numbering is page 14, but on the longer number at the bottom right hand side of the page, it's the number ending 1932. HG1 is tab 2, Mr. Grant. Thank you. 1932. Yes. There's a 14 just above it. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to comment about, about this, but um, the, the details probably don't matter. You ended up in the accident and emergency department of this hospital. What the article is, is, is saying, or maybe trying to say, is that here is a, a famous man, he, he didn't pull rank, he waited his turn in the queue. We all know from these A&E departments that you sometimes have to wait a long time, particularly if, if it's not serious, you made no complaint. This all reflects rather well on you. Do, do, do you follow that? And that, that's yeah, but what they were trying to get at. That's not my interpretation of the story. The, the, okay. the classic tabloid technique to cover a really egregious breach of someone's privacy Yes. is to wrap it up in a nice story. So if they photograph someone's baby, they'll say, oh, what a pretty baby, to try and stop the parents suing them for breach of privacy. And this is exactly the same. This is an article which says not only that I went to hospital, but what I went for. It's my medical records. It yes. said I it gives exact complaint that I was dizzy and short of breath, yes. which to me is a gross intrusion in my privacy. Yes. And they have deliberately dressed that up as a flattering article about how un I was uh, to try and get away with that. Yes. It, it ended up, I think, I'll, I'll come back to um, further comments on it, but I, it, it ended up with the, the son either paying damages or um, paying, to, paying to a charity, is that right? Yeah, it wasn't just the son who ran that piece, the, the Express ran a piece similar, as I recall, and I, as I say in my statement, by that stage of my life, this was only uh, this year, was it? I think it was yes. this year. I uh, was weary and, you know, certainly to a degree wary of endless lawsuits against tabloids. They take a long time, it's a lot of stress. So I tried to short-circuit it by offering them, look, there will be no lawsuit if you just each pay £5,000 to a charity which <clears throat> I support called Health Talk Online and seeing as they had both talked about my health online I thought that was elegant right. and uh, the Express flatly refused to pay a penny and the, after much protesting the Sun uh, gave the charity £1,500. Okay. Is this your point Mr Grant that it doesn't matter whether the, 
underlying story is, is, is true. The, the, the point is it's, it's an invasion of your privacy and there is not a public interest in people putting out articles about, about your health. Is that your point in a nutshell? Uh, I think no one would expect, no British citizen would expect their medical records to be made public mm. or to be appropriated by newspapers for commercial profit. I think that's fundamental to our um, British sense of decency. Right. To, to be fair to the Sun, we, we don't know the, the, the source of the story from the article itself. Though. No, maybe it was just a lucky guess. Mm. Well, I don't think they're probably suggesting that, no. but it could be a number of different places. I well, what would they be, um, sir? Would the there could well be evidence about this, this later, but the, the story apparently came from a picture agency who'd been tipped off by a non-medical employee at the hospital. Could that be true? Well, there was no picture, so that bit's a little weird. Right. But um, for them to know my medical, the details of why I went there, hmm. it must have been someone with access to the computer where you, you register. Um, I'm... I hope, and I'm sure it was none of the medical staff who I have to say were fantastic in that mm. hospital, as they always are. But I suspect that it was the age-old system of someone at the hospital being on a retainer from uh, either a tabloid newspaper or perhaps a picture agency. You know, if anyone famous comes in, you tell us and here's, you know, 50 quid or 500 quid, whatever it is. I'm quite sure, in, well, my opinion is that that was the source. Okay. As it had been back in June 1996, and um, uh, as it was again recently in the case of my baby. Okay. Now, in paragraph 16 and 17 of your, your statement, you, you, you deal with um, other intrusions on your, your privacy, which um, I think we'll just, if you don't mind, take as, 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 as read. But I, I would like to move on to paragraph 18 and the um, section about paparazzi you give you give one one example um, at the bottom of pa uh, paragraph 18 about being chased at high speed your, your girlfriend was could you tell us a little bit more about that well that was relatively common occurrence uh, with two of the girlfriends I've had um, they both have children and um, in both cases, um, well, actually, that's not quite fair. The first girlfriend, when she was with me, we didn't have children, so that doesn't apply. But the second girlfriend, uh, although that first girlfriend has subsequently had children and been very badly um, chased and abused, but the, the, the second girlfriend, she did have children, and she was uh, frequently, especially in the early days of our romance, yes. uh, followed and chased, even when she had her children in the car, and even when uh, the children were not enjoying it, crying, they pulled up for petrol, they'd ask the paparazzi who pulled in and started taking pictures, please go away, you know, there's children in this car, they're frightened, and uh, these paparazzi would continue to take pictures. Yes. And then they'd be bought by one of the national newspapers. Yes. Yeah. The paparazzi presumably all working freelance, are they not? Yeah, as I explain in this statement, uh, there are two kinds of... Uh, press photographer, there are the ones who are on staff for the papers, and they just occasionally show a modicum of decency, although they didn't in the case of recently my baby. They staked out uh, a, a new mother for three days. She couldn't really leave her home. And then there are the much worse freelance paparazzi who are increasingly, um, well, the police tell me, increasingly recruited from uh, criminal classes. Very often they have criminal records. They've been previous in different fields of, of crime previous to being paparazzi and who will really stop at nothing, who show no mercy and no ethics because the bounty on some of these pictures is very high. Yes. And uh, uh, I suspect that the ones who, for instance, uh, were chasing my girlfriend and her children were those freelance types. I suspect they were the ones who tried to take, who always tried to take pictures up girls' skirts and then digitally remove their underwear because they can sell the, the picture for a little more if they do that. I suspect they're the ones who were following Princess Diana uh, when she died and whom the uh, tabloid papers, particularly the Daily Mail, promised they would never um, 
buy pictures from again, but which they subsequently did about three months later? Not now, but I'd like to come back to uh, the mechanisms whereby any of that can be controlled, just for your view on it, but not now. Mr. Jay will come to it. Sure. Move on to the, to the issue of hacking, Mr. Grant, mm. which you cover in, in some detail. You, to set the scene, you, you tell us in paragraph 24 that warnings started to come through from media lawyers about how to protect privacy. And, and amongst the advice they gave was that phone numbers should be changed frequently and um, voicemails set on pins other than defaults. Can, can you remember when those warnings started to emanate? I can't exactly, but I mean, I'm guessing it was uh, early 2000s, you know, sort of 2000 to 2005, that kind of time. Right. And were, were you the direct recipient of such warnings? I had circular emails that were sent from uh, shillings in media lawyers to lots of clients and to ex-clients. I think I might have been an ex-client of shillings by then, I can't remember. And I remember looking at this list, it was just a warning saying, you know, these are the, some of the things they're up to. Be careful of Bluetooth, be careful of your PIN numbers, be careful of um, uh, your phones, and so on. Right. Get your car swept. And, and then, um, paragraph 25, you said it was about 2004, hmm. someone came from the Information Commissioner's office. Yes, out of the blue. And um, can, can you remember whether, whether it was a policeman who came or was it a, an official from the Inform Information Commission? Well, to be honest with you, I've always been confused about that. He was not wearing a uniform. But for some reason, I've always told the story as a policeman and maybe he had a rank <coughs> or something. I, I, right. I wish I could tell you accurately. And I can't find, I've looked everywhere, I've looked everywhere for the details of the meeting, but I mean, it definitely happened. I didn't make it up. He came to my house, he sat in my kitchen and he told me that they had arrested a private detective, a private investigator, who, whose notebook contained uh, intimate personal details on a number of people, and I was one of them, it, and uh, that it contained my uh, address, the address of my some close friends, um, relations. I remember him saying uh, phone numbers, although I know you're about to contest that, but mm. I can't imagine they'd come to tell me someone just had my address, because everyone had my address. Um, and uh, I said, well, who is this person working for? And he said, well, it looks from his notebook like he's working for most of the British press. Yes, which, which might suggest it was the Information Commissioner's office rather than, than, than Mr. Malcare. But you know, I'm, sure it, well, I'm sure it wasn't Malcare. I'm sure I, it was... I think you'll find the Information Commissioner employs ex-police officers. Yes. Yes, we know that because there was the story recently in the Independent about one of those police officers who was shocked that at the end of this particular inquiry uh, they weren't allowed to interview any of the journalists who'd hired the private detective in the first place. Yes. Well, you're, you're in danger of foreshadowing evidence we'll be hearing ne next week from, from the relevant person. But um, what I need to put to you, Mr. Grant, is, is that it's clearly the Information Commissioner's office's position uh, that they never discovered any evidence relating to phone hacking. So if, if, if that's right, it would suggest that your, your recollection must be, must be incorrect and you must be confusing this with the Malcare notebooks and not the, I, I'm the Whittemore notebooks. Well, I'm definitely, I know that this wasn't the Malcare case right. that, that came to me. Uh, as I said to you before, I cannot understand why they would come and tell me that a man had my address because everyone had my address. The paps were out there all, you know, all the time. Yes. Uh, so if he didn't also have my phone numbers, at the very least, and I think he said PIN numbers as well, then um, I don't understand why he'd come to see me. Yes. But of course, can I just break that down? Uh, having your, addre your address, or that may not be that um, a difficult a piece of data to obtain, uh, could be obtained in breach of the Data Protection Act. Do you follow me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it may be that you are you are associating what could have been a, a reasonably limited, if, if, if not um, unremarkable, discussion, which was limited to breaches of the Data Protection Act, and then extrapolating from that and bringing in more sinister details about PIN numbers and 
possible evidence of voicemail hacking. We'll have to leave it. That? We're obviously not going to agree on this, so we'll have to leave it. I have to park that issue. Mm. But certainly they were telling me about blagging and, and yes. that kind of thing. Certainly. Yeah. Was that, was that the phrase they used? I can't remember. It was 2004. But I, it was... I, I, it was I don't think you ought to assume that Mr. J is agreeing or disagreeing. The fact is that, as I'm sure you appreciate, it's very important that those others who are going to give evidence, uh, some of them have seen parts of what you've said in order to comment yeah and part of the system is that you are asked about their concerns so that yeah. you can respond yeah. but you shouldn't assume that because mr jay is asking the question he necessarily is agreeing with or disagreeing with the proposition that he's putting to you i understand was mr whittemore's name mentioned by the gentleman ex-policeman or otherwise from the information commissioner's office i don't think so but seeing as that whole inquiry was about the Whittemore arrest, mm. it's difficult to imagine that it was about anyone else. Yes. You, you, you learned that subsequently, didn't you? Yeah. The, the, the next event um, was a chance encounter with a Mr. Paul McMullen, Mr. Grant, and you, you deal with that first in paragraph well, you deal with it in paragraph 26 of your witness statement. Yeah. And um, tell us about the chance in encounter. I mean, I think we've, we've read about it, but you've, um, you ended up in the same car as him, didn't you? Yes. I, I broke down yes. in my car in Kent, in the remotest countryside, just before Christmas last year, and uh, thought, what am I going to do? I'm late for my appointment. And uh, there was no taxis around, it was Christmassy, it was icy. And then amazingly a car van pulled up in the other carriageway, of the, this dual carriageway, and I thought, oh good, some nice Kentish person has come to help. And um, instead out stepped a man with a great long lens. I thought, I can't believe in the middle of Kent, in the middle of winter, there's a, there's a pap. And he came over, he was taking lots of pictures. Mm. I wasn't entirely polite to him. And... Uh, then, to my horror, I realized there, there was no other way of getting to this appointment. He kept yeah. saying, do you want a lift? And I thought, I know this is in your interest to, that I take the lift. And I kept saying no. Finally, I did. So then I was suddenly in the car with this man, <coughs> with my friend. And uh, that is when he revealed that he was an ex-News of the World Features editor who's now uh, retired and running a pub down in Dover. And uh, he kept his camera in his glove box of his car just in case of some happy accident, which he'd just encountered. And then he went on to tell me all these fascinating things, boasting really about how extensive phone hacking had been at the, at the News of the World, how Andy Coulson had known about it for sure, how um, they had um, enjoyed the competitive sycophancy of five successive governments, of um, the way they paid off the police, and I was thinking for years, and I, and I was thinking, well, this is all amazing stuff. I wish I was, had a tape recorder. Yes. And so he dropped... to cut a long story short, the next time you saw him, you did have a tape recorder. That's right, isn't yes, it? Yes, that is right, yes. Uh, and, and indeed, if you... There's, there's a piece about it in the New Statesman, um, which again in our, our bundle, HG1, yeah. on the internal numbering, it's page 15, but on the longer number, it ends 1933. Yeah. It's quite a zippy title. Thank you. Is, is this, uh, Mr. Grant, a verbatim transcript of the tape recording? Yes. There are boring bits left out. I, I put in just all the, the juicy bits. Well, we, we've all read it. And we're, I'm not going to go over all of it, you understand, but, mm. but, but I have been asked to go over in particular, and I was in any event intending to do so. The, the, the very bottom of, of the first page... Yeah. You're, you're, you're chipping in. It reads at the moment, and dot, 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 it wasn't just the news of the world, it was, and then it continues. Um, first of all, what, can you remember what, what goes in the dot, dot, dot? No. 
that would be one of the boring bits. But, I mean, uh, it's nothing sinister. It, 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 or it could be that the jukebox was too loud at that point. The, the, the tape recording is quite hard to hear, and I was only able to transcribe it, you know, <coughs> having just had the meeting, I was... Yes. Yeah. Well, I suppose if necessary, we, uh, we're not going to do it now, but um, we could listen to it if, if, if you agreed. Yeah, well... Would you have a problem with that? I do have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I did my revenge number on Paul McMullen, and I... For me, that's the issue closed with him. Mm. And when I've had now two separate police inquiries, the one into uh, police corruption and the other one into phone hacking, they've come to me and they've asked me for the tape and I've uh, refused because it uh, seems to me uh, too harsh. I, I don't want to be sending Paul McMullen to prison. Uh, in addition to which, he has to be given some credit for having been uh, a whistleblower on all this stuff. Okay, well... We, we note that answer, but I, I've got to continue with your question. Yeah. It wasn't just the news of the world. It was, you know, the, the mail. That was very much a leading question, Mr. Grant, wasn't it? Yes. But there, was, there was no evidence. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm allowed to, do, I'm allowed to ask leading questions. Yes. Fair enough. But there was, there was no evidence that, that you had, to your personal knowledge, that the mail was involved in this at all. Who said? I'm asking, you, I'm asking you to be very careful when you answer the question. Don't, don't share speculation with us. Don't, don't share an opinion. We're, we're looking for evidence. There isn't any evidence, is there? The evidence for the Daily Mail being involved in phone hacking, for me, would be uh, the article we spoke about earlier, mm. the Plummy Voice Woman, and it would be Paul McMullen's answer to this question. OK, well, let, let's look at the answer then. Oh, absolutely, yeah. When I went freelance in 2004, the biggest pairs, you thought it would be the news of the world, but actually it was the Daily Mail. If I take a good picture, the first person I go to is, such as in your case, the Mail on Sunday. Did you see that story, the picture of you breaking down? I ought to thank you for that. I got £3,000. He's, he's talking there about selling a photograph of you, isn't he? Well... He segues into that, but the, the, I didn't leave anything out, and, and, you know, if it helps, you can come around to my house and listen to the tape. Mm. I left nothing out between, uh, it wasn't just the news of the world, it was, you know, the mail, and him answering, oh, absolutely, yeah. When I went freelance in 2004, the biggest pairs, you'd have thought it was the news of the world, but mm. actually it was the Daily Mail. Um, that is the sequence of the conversation, yeah. nothing left out. So, so what you're asking us to do, then, is to is to read carefully what he says and interpret his, his answer. And certainly one highly reasonable interpretation of his answer is that he's, he's limiting his comment, his evidence, um, if, if you like, to the selling of photographs, isn't he? As I said before, he segues in that answer straight on to photographs. He goes, if I take a good picture, the first person yeah. I go to is. So I agree that it's strange uh, syntax, mm. it's a segue, but I have no reason to believe that his answer, oh, absolutely, yeah, uh, referred to uh, the Daily Mail being involved in phone hacking. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Graham. Well, I have to ask this, this, this blunt question. I mean, we'll hear from Mr. Mullen and have his version. Uh, had he been drinking? Had I been drinking? No, had Mr. McMullen been drinking? <laughs> um, he didn't seem drunk at all. He didn't? No. Okay. And then you say... But why would they, the mail, buy a phone-hacked story? Well, isn't that a bit of an odd question, given that he hadn't referred to a phone-hacked story? It's not an odd question at all, given that he'd just done this strange segue. Mm -hmm. So there, there's me trying to get him back on the interesting bit. It's not interesting mm -hmm. that they bought photographs of me broken down. It's very interesting whether they were involved in phone-hacking or not. So what I do is that I immediately, and there's, there's no dot, dot, dots here, I say, but would they, the mail, buy a phone-hacked story? to which he answers, for about four or five years, they've been absolutely cleaner than clean, and before that, they weren't. They were as dirty as anyone. They had the most money. Well, it's a matter for the comments, but he, he has not given any details there of, of any 
specific phone hacking activity by the Daily Mail, has he? No. And then we can, we can read on um, through the rest of it. Some of the rest of what he says is, is, is quite controversial, so it's probably best if, if I don't read it out. But, but I, I thought this inquiry was for controversy. Yes, yes. but some of it is, is, is controversial in the sense, Mr Grant, that it names particular names of people who... So? Well, well I'll, I'll explain. Uh, you know perfectly well there's a police investigation going on. Ah, well, that, yes. And uh, I've got to be extremely careful... I, I understand that. ...that I don't prejudice yeah. any potential prosecution. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I'm sure you wouldn't want to either. No, I wouldn't. OK. It, it is his right to say, in, in, in case I sound too coy, this has been published in the New Statesman, it's in the public domain, yeah. anybody can Google it. Yeah. And... Um, Frankly, we'll leave it, we'll, we'll leave it at, at, at that, if you don't mind. Are you saying for clarity, Mr. Mr. Grant, that if, if the inquiry wanted to listen just to the bits of the tape which we have been discussing specifically, that's something <coughs> which you would be comfortable with or uncomfortable with? Uh, those bits, yes, because I don't think they send McMullen to prison, so that's fine. Thank you. I want to make it clear, I'm not being too coy about the investigation. I've made some rulings about how we're going to go, and we're going to do it. But uh, I don't want to add unnecessary um, material into the public domain beyond that which it's necessary for me to go to identify the culture, practice, and ethics of the press. I, I get that. <clears throat> and to be absolutely clear, we are hearing from Mr. McMullen as well. So the, um, oh, good luck. <coughs> the position will be um, fully explored with yep. him. Well, that's that's a helpful v vignette into the case, the the McMullen incident. Mm. But uh, you, you also tell us about, and I'm back. I'm afraid to paragraph 27 of your witness statement. Earlier this year, officers from Operation Wheating come and see you, and mm. we've heard two other witnesses today speak about um, the same sort of situation. Huh. Uh, and they tell you that your phone had been hacked. C could you just tell us a little bit about that, that meeting, please? Um, yes, they rang my lawyer, the police rang my lawyer, wanted to show me some evidence. They came round and uh, it was one of the previous witnesses today uh, explained they, it's quite a formal thing. They, they get out these pages and they formally sort of announce them and then they say, would you have a look at this page? Is there anything on there you recognize? And I looked at it and I saw various phone numbers of mine and, uh, from the uh, middle of the 2000, 2005, something like that, uh, together with some PIN numbers, together with some access numbers. You know, you used to get a separate phone number to to ring your messages remotely from another phone. And then there were other names I recognized on there. Um, people around me, girlfriends, people I knew, numbers, words that uh, all sort of made sense. And in one particular case, uh, it triggered a memory of um, uh, a couple of stories that had been in the uh, Daily Mirror and in the um, Daily Mail. And... Uh, I found that interesting. Hmm. What they, but when you see these pieces of paper in the police inquiry, they redact certain bits, including the famous top left-hand corner, which is where Malcare kept the initials of the particular journalist who had commissioned the phone hacking. And so subsequent to that meeting with the police, I was very interested to know who had commissioned hmm. that particular page of hacking, seeing as it hadn't that this, this particular story had not appeared in the uh, News of the World, but had appeared in the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror. Mm. But again, you, you mentioned the, the Daily Mail. You, you mentioned it for the first time, because it's not in your, 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 your witness statement. Yes, it is. 28. Oh, pardon me. Yeah. Yes, my, my apologies, you have. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But just for the avoidance of doubt, the, the top corner, which, of course... We're ciphering again for the reasons I've explained. That was, in fact, somebody 
who you linked News of the World? To get access to the redacted top left-hand corner, I was told I had to um, uh, ask for it formally through a court. I had to get a disclosure order yes. from the Metropolitan Police. So I got it, and it was, in fact, or seemed to be... Um, a journalist from the News of the World. Right. So that is, a, that is a mystery that he commissioned the work, but it appeared in the Mail and the Mirror. Yeah. It's a mystery we're not, I believe, going to be able to, to, to bottom out today or possibly um, at all. May I move on, please, to your, your supplementary statement? This, this deals with, with quite recent events, um, culminating in the, the grant of a, an injunction last week by Mr Justice Tugendhat, and we've seen a copy of, 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 of his judgment. Um, first of all, can I, can I ask you please to look at HG2, which will be behind your witness statement in this bundle, not as a separate tab. I'm not going to go into this in much detail unless you want me to. It, it relates to the front page in the News of the World the greeting is Happy Easter. It's the 24th of April of this year. It looks as if these are photographs taken with a telephoto lens. Is that right? Uh, I would imagine so, yes. I was oh. definitely unaware they were being taken. I wish I could find a piece of paper. G give, me, give me another clue where it is. Yes. What's the tab number? It's, it's under tab two. If you go through the first six or seven pages, yeah. you'll reach the end of your witness statement, and then you should find the start of an exhibit, HG2. And the first couple of pages of the exhibit are, the first three pages, are the article we are referring to. Are you with me on that? I, I, obviously, I'm being stupid. I, I'm, on, I'm on the second tab. I'm third, tab at, third tab. Third tab. I can have my copy if there's any problem with it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Is it, well, it's got a one underneath the statement? Yes. So you've got it now. I mean, we're not concerned with the, the headline, we're not really concerned with the detail, uh, uh, unless you want to discuss it. The, the real point is that this is a, a telephoto lens, clearly, and you're unaware that these photographs are being taken. Correct. Right? And you also say in your statement that you weren't in asked to comment before the piece was published along with the photographs. Oh, correct. And had you been asked to comment, what, what might you have said? I would have said uh, nothing. That which is, I would have, um, there would have been no, I wouldn't have returned the calls. No one would have returned the calls. Yes. Might you have taken proactive steps to protect your privacy, for example, by taking legal proceedings? Uh, if I'd done that, it would have drawn attention to the whole story. My o overwhelming motive throughout this whole episode yes. was to protect the mother of my child from a press storm. So yes. anything like uh, what you've just suggested would have been one way of alerting the media. It would have been a matter of public record, and they would have thought, oh, here's a good story, and her life would have been made hell, as it subsequently was. Yes. But then turning that on its head by, by doing nothing, your life and her life was made hell anyway, wasn't it? Well, we, we held them off for a surprisingly long time. Um, they, uh, after this article, they followed her around. She was a single pregnant woman. She was being tailed by paparazzi, one in particular who frightened her a lot Yes. Uh, over the months of her pregnancy. Uh, but they didn't have anything to print that could link her to me until I visited the hospital after the birth, when, again, there seems to have been a leak from the hospital. And at that point, 
the dam was breached and we got a we were bombarded with calls uh, saying we know that this happened that, 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 your, that Ting Lang had a baby in the hospital and Hugh visited and they even knew the fake name she checked into the hospital under so clearly there had been a leak and then again my attitude was to say nothing which we did for a long time and a lot of pressure was put on the, the typical pressure of the tabloids in this case it was the, the Daily Mail who had to seem to have all the information um, the details of the hospital and the fake name etc they kept saying we're going to print we're going to print the story anyway what's your comment and because I've got wise to this technique over the years mm it seemed to me that was a fishing technique and that they didn't want to print the story based solely on their hospital source because that might have been unethical or possibly illegal so they needed a comment from my side and that is why I said nothing and I asked all my various my, my assistant in London and my PR people in, in America who didn't even know about this baby to say nothing as well. Well we're moving ahead a bit and there's, there's some quite important detail before we get okay, to that I'm stage. Sorry. Particularly in paragraph five, with yeah. the Europeans on, on question time in, in, in July, yeah. and then you tell us about the the, the phone calls to, um, um, to Ting Lan, Miss Kong's um, phone number, yeah. and we we see what, what what you say about it. And the man said, "Tell Hugh Grant to to shut the fuck up." Now, after that, were the police involved? When she told me about it the next day, I immediately called my lawyer, and yes. he, uh, we agreed to uh, get the police onto it, which we did. Uh, but at the last moment, Ting Lan, the mother, probably rightly in retrospect, said, let's not do that because there's always a chance of a leak from the police, and that will bring down the press storm on my head. Right. So we didn't. But taking that in stages, the contact was made with the police. The police were willing to assist, were they not? Yes, they were. But then um, they were, as it were, called off because of concern about leaks from the press to the police. That's the sequence of events, isn't from it? From the police to the press. Police to the press. Yeah. Yes. You touch on this, or you deal with this, at the final sentence of paragraph six of your second statement. Yeah. You know, I'm going to ask you to try and exclude from your mind um, supposition, speculation and opinion. Do, do you have any direct evidence of leaks from the police to the press of which you can give us evidence, Mr Grant? I'm not quite sure what, where supposition blends into evidence. Mm. But what you have direct knowledge of, can we start with that? <clears throat> All I know is that for a number of years, although it did get better in recent years, if someone like me called the police for a, a burglary, a mugging, something in the street, something that happened to one of me or my girlfriend, the chances are that a photographer or reporter would turn up on your doorstep before a policeman. So whether you call that supposition or, or fact, I don't know. Um, and on top of that, I have, of course, also all Paul McMullen's recorded um, testimony not testimony, but what he said about paying the police that, you know, a third of the Metropolitan Police were on backhanders from yes. the tabloid press. I think, I think there you're commenting on, on other people's evidence. It, if, can, we, can we try and confine it to your, to your own sure. evidence and your own Well, experience. it wasn't just me who experienced this phenomenon of, of reporters or, or paparazzi mm. coming around instead of a policeman. Uh, other people who had been in the public eye who I used to have this conversation with complained of exactly the same thing. Right. I think, I think what I'm trying to do is trying to ask you to give an example of something which might give rise to the inference that there was a leak from the police to the press, but it's an example from your own experience, not, not, not you commenting on someone else's experience. Uh, do, you, well, do you see my point? Yeah, I'm trying to think of a specific one. I certainly remember my one girlfriend being mugged and... Uh, we called the police, and, and it was the phot photographers who came around first. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then, going back to your, your second witness statement, you visited um, the hospital, I think, the, 
the day after the child's birth. Yeah. Correct, isn't it? So I, th I, I think, if you don't mind me giving the, the date that fits into the chronology, it's the, the end of September, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, what, what happened after, after that visit in terms of well, press interest? I had been uh, very reluctant to be present at the birth because of the danger of a leak from the hospital bringing this press storm down on uh, the mother of my child and what was about to be my child. Yes. So I had actually made a plan with the mother not to, not to visit at all, but to visit when she got home from hospital a few days later. She was very happy with that plan. She had her parents there. She had my cousin there, my female cousin. Yes. Uh, but actually, on the day after the birth, I couldn't resist um, a quick visit. I thought, I'm going to try and get away with this. I went. I had a look. It was, uh, it was very nice. And, uh, but the day after that, I think it was, the phone call started from uh, the Daily Mail, and in this case, saying, we know about... Uh, Ting Lang having had this baby, we know about Hugh having visited, we know what name she checked in under, mm. we're going to write this story. So all my fears about the leak had been, seemed to have been justified. It's the, the evidence you, you provide to the inquiry in relation to that, yeah. um, this again is in the Exhibit HG2, which, yeah. which I'll hope, you, um, hope you're going to be able to find in that bundle that uh, we can provide it to you, provide it to you separately. They're, they're examples of, of emails and texts dated the 21st of October, which is three, three weeks and a bit after the birth. Yeah. Thank you. To be clear about this, the, the Daily Mail did not publish a story, did they, until it had, the news had been broken by someone else. That's right, isn't it? <clears throat> they threatened to, but, but because we didn't comment, they didn't, until it was broken by an American magazine. Mm. You say they, they threatened to, but, but another way of looking at this is that until they had a comment from you confirming the truth of the story, they quite rightly decided not to publish. Uh, that, would that, be, that, would, that would be wrong. Uh, it doesn't say it in these emails, but you could bring, up, bring in my assistant or my uh, publicity people in New York who started to get the calls as well. And on these phone calls, it was consistently, we are publishing this story tomorrow, mm. which is a, brink, a tactic of brinkmanship to make you say something so they can stand up the story that was otherwise have to stand up entirely on a piece of leaked yes. information from a hospital. Well, whatever, whatever they they were saying to you in order to try and get you to confirm or deny the story, oh. it, it, it is an incontestable fact that they, they didn't publish the story, did they? Uh, they did not, no. no. And, and it's a fair inference, isn't it, that uh, the reason why they didn't publish the story is that uh, you hadn't confirmed its truth. I disagree with your interpretation. I think the reason they didn't publish it is because they would not have looked good to have published it merely on leaked information from a hospital, which is unethical but they might have obtained the information from somewhere else altogether, mightn't they? Uh, it's possible, but mm. uh, so highly unlikely that I find it incredible. Mm. Was there interest from other uh, newspapers at about this time? There was the Daily Star, I think, uh, mm. were onto it in some way, yeah. Mm. But originally, the, the, whole, the whole story had been the subject of, um, uh, back in the days of the pregnancy, had been the subject of, news of the world interest, yes. one journalist in particular. And when the news of the world was uh, closed down, that journalist appears to have moved over to the Daily Mail because a lot of this work and these calls come from that same journalist yes. now representing the Daily Mail. That's right. There's no evidence that that journalist they took any photographs with him from the news of the world to the Daily Mail, is there? The photographs subsequently published in the Daily Mail when they did publish uh, a story about my baby 
uh, some of those came from, are identical to the pictures used earlier by the News of the World. So uh, whether he took the pictures himself or, or one of his photographers took the pictures, they are the same pictures that the News of the World used, long lens surveillance shots mm. that the Daily Mail subsequently published um, more recently. Right. And those pictures could have been purchased from the same paparazzo, that's the single singular of the of the noun, who had provided the photographs to the News of the World originally, couldn't they? Uh, yes, they could. Okay. I'm going to deal slightly out of sequence before going back with the incident which culminated in um, injunction proceedings in front of Mr. Justice Tugendhat. Mm. You cover this in paragraph 20 of your supplementary statement. Yeah. It was potentially, it was uh, a very dangerous incident because the grandmother of the child had to jump out of the way of the car in which was one or more of these, these individuals with the cameras. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, the, the house where the mother of my child and my child were besieged um, was surrounded by these paparazzi and I asked my lawyer what could possibly be done. He said, well, maybe if they get some pictures of some of these people, we can, we can have a chance, we can ask yes. them to be called off. So the mother, the 61-year-old mother, grandmother of my child, went out into the street, took a picture of a man sitting in a car with a great big camera. Uh, he turned around, took a lot of pictures of her, wound the window down, shouted a lot, lot of abuse at her, and then as she crossed the road, he, he menaced her with his car, drove at her very fast, made her jump out of the way, and then at the end of the road, he did a U-turn and came back and menaced her again with the car. Yes. I think, I think the police were also involved, were they not? Well, the police have been called, and they're, they're coming to um, see Ting Lang on Wednesday about this. Yeah. Oh, right. At the, at the, at the time... Uh, my understanding is the police offered to go round and to get a statement or just investigate the matter with the mother and the grandmother. Do you, do you know about that? I think, I, I can't remember, I think we may have uh, thought about that. I can't remember yes. the exact facts of that, but certainly the police should be involved in this. Yes. Well, the police, the police did, did want to become involved, and they, they were told, and there's no suggestion that this is, this is improper, they were told by your solicitor you'd prefer in the first instance to get an injunction. Is that, is that possible? Well, uh, that may be true that uh, my solicitor said that, and he may have well have been right in that yes. uh, a police investigation would have taken some time. It might have, in the end, put one bad pap away, but there were a whole bunch of them outside. And seeing as this was an egregious uh, event, likely to warrant um, an injunction against all of these people, uh, that, that seems like the right tactic that he adopted. Yes. Well, no, no one's questioning the, okay. the tactic or the strategy, okay. uh, and, and we know uh, what has happened, and we've read the reasons of Mr. Justice okay. um, Tugendhat, which um, in, in, in a publicly available mm. um, judgment. But as, as, as a little coda to this, um, this, these, these serious matters, um, your, your publicist put out a, a statement about the about the birth in the end Is that right yeah in the end having held off all that time from all these inquiries and this brinkmanship from uh, the British papers uh, the and a magazine in America us magazine seemed to have got hold of the story yes and they published at which point uh, I was in a sort of no-win situation mm. I in the end decided the best thing to do because the the story within hours was going to go everywhere and particularly into the British tabloids and I was very anxious that they would give it a, a, a twisted spin so I thought the best thing to do would be to be as honest about the thing as possible so I said I was um, delighted with the birth but I did not want the papers to write a twisted version which suggested that Ting Lan was a jilted girlfriend uh, so I tried to find a form of words to say that she was um, a friend but had not been a formal um, girlfriend and that therefore there was no question of her having been jilted as a pregnant mother. Mm. 
Was it, was it your form of words or your publicist's form of words? Well, we had a hasty uh, conversation on the phone while I was filming in Germany. It was not, not ideal circumstances. I was dressed as a cannibal at the time. And... <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you were, but the, the, the form of words which were lighted upon were these. I can confirm, this is your publicist speaking on your behalf. Yeah. Hugh Grant is the, the delighted father of a baby girl, well, so far, um, so good as it were. He and the mother had a fleeting affair, and while this was not planned, Hugh could not be happier or more supportive. Mm. Um, putting it bluntly, weren't, weren't you leading with the chin a bit with that form of words? Well, as I just said to you, I felt it was important to be honest and not yeah. to have a wrong version, a twisted version, appear in the papers, which was that she was my girlfriend who'd been dumped when she got pregnant, which was simply not the case, mm. or that it was a planned pregnancy that I then ran away from. Um, so I was protecting her reputation as a... I didn't want her to appear to be a jilted girlfriend. I was protecting mine. I didn't want to seem that I was a monster who ran away from my girlfriend. Mm. And um, it's true, I have been given a hard time for using those words, because, which is ironic, seeing as it's actually the truth. But that doesn't seem to be very popular. Well, one, one alternative strategy might have been to say, um, simply to confirm the birth of the child and your delighted father, but otherwise worse to the effect, um, this is a, a private matter and neither the mother nor the father wish to comment further. Yeah, which would have been an invitation to the uh, papers to write something um, invented about the relationship that I had with, yes. the, with that girl. They, if in the absence of information, they'll make it up. See, what, what did happen in, in, in response to the form of words mm. you, you selected? Um, you, you, you alight on one piece in the Daily Mail by Amanda Platel, which um, um, is, is written in, in, in a particular tone or house style. But, but um, uh, other newspapers have have put in similar pieces, as you, you're aware. Um, Giles Corwin in The Times, uh, saying words to the effect that you should um, marry the woman. There's something even in The Guardian, which isn't altogether complimentary, and something in The Daily Telegraph. So, I mean, it could be said, if um, all organs of the press are intruding into your privacy, but... He, each, the, the, the theme from each of them is, is not inconsistent. Do you well, follow me? First of all, there were some supportive uh, pieces as well, especially yes. in the broadsheets, that said that, you know, gave me some credit for having stood up, put my hand up and said, this is my baby and I'm delighted with yes. it, and, and, you know, providing for the child and the mother. Uh, the, um, the, the, the hatchet jobs... That's fine. I, I expect hatchet jobs. That's been the story of the last 17 years. Mm. Uh, but it always does make you grind your teeth slightly when they're based on uh, falsities and misreportings. And a lot of those hatchet jobs were based, for instance, on the fact that I now had a 21-year-old German girlfriend, whereas, in fact, I don't. That was an invented girlfriend, invented by a German tabloid and then copied out faithfully by uh, British hacks. Uh, and it was also based on... The hatchet jobs were based on the fact that I'd appeared to only visit for half an hour callously the day after the birth, when in fact, if I'd been a really good father, I wouldn't have visited at all, seeing as it brought down a press storm on the mother's head. Yeah. But is it... Um, I'll just finish this little sequence of evidence before we'll, we'll break. But in terms of, in terms of, of your, your privacy, is, is, is it your, your position that... Um, these matters should not have been covered at all in the press? Or is it your, your position that they should have been covered in, in a certain way, in a way which didn't misrep misrepresent? Can, well, can of course, we if, clear, you, if you please? cling to the naive notion that uh, newspapers are there to report the truth, um, nothing could really be wrong with that. I mean, I, I, I had a baby with this girl. She's a, she's a good friend of mine. She still is a good friend. Yes. It's a nice thing. I, there's, there's really not much more to it than that. Um, but that doesn't sell newspapers, so a nasty spin has to be given to it. Yes. Hence the um, extraordinary efforts of various newspapers to dig dirt on the new mother, happily enjoying her new baby 
while the Daily Mail paid £125,000 to her ex-lover to sell private pictures of her. So I, I think your complaint is it's, it's not the intrusion into your privacy per se, it is the nasty spin they put on a story which had they reported in a fairer and more accurate way would have been a proper story for no, them to print. Is, I think, is that no, right? No, I, it's both. There are, there are moments here which are intrusions into privacy. I think that if you've paid off someone at the Portland Hospital to tell you about um, some, a, a celebrity's baby, mm. that's an invasion of privacy. Um, but, uh, for instance. But there's also uh, ugly spin being put on a lot of this stuff mm. because it sells papers better. And in the opinion of some people, the particularly ugly spin in the last few weeks given to the birth of my baby was not unrelated to the fact that I'm here today giving yeah. evidence at this inquiry. And it's referenced in some of those hatchet jobs, including by Amanda Patel. She, she gives my uh, concern about abuses of the tabloid press as a particular reason why I should be loathed. So it, it is possible for some people to, to, to see a connection between those hatchet jobs and what I'm saying here and have said for the last few months. Yes, but the, the bit that you threw in about paying off someone at the Portland Hospital, that, that is, a, I must say, I will must suggest, just a piece of speculation on your part. You don't know that that's how the story broke at all, do you? Unless the, uh, my cousin rang up the Daily Mail and told them, or the Chinese parents who speak no English did that, mm. it's very hard to draw any other conclusion. Mm. Do you know how the uh, American um, paper or magazine got hold of the story? No. Yes. Okay, well, that, that, so maybe a convenient... Um, mm -hmm. All right. we'll, we'll, we'll have a break, and you can have a break too, but let me just ask this. You've been granted uh, relief by Miss Justice Tugendhat. Has that grant of relief been reflected in your child and her mother being left alone? Yes. Very grateful for it. Well, uh, you'll be conscious that I've made it clear that uh, I would want to know if intrusion arose as a result of anybody giving evidence to this inquiry. Yeah, I heard that, and I'm grateful for that, too. Sir, before you rise, can I deal with two very brief matters of chronology? Yeah. The first was raised in relation to the 1996 Daily Mirror article that Mr Grant <coughs> refers to in paragraph 13 of his witness statement. And so you asked that uh, it might be possible that we would have the dates. Can I just give you those dates, because we've managed to obtain them? Yeah. The, as I understand it, the visit to the hospital was uh, in May 1996, the 29th of May. Yes, that. Yes. The article which appeared in the Sunday Mirror was on the 23rd of June of 1996. The adjudication was not until the 27th of July of 1997. <laughs> so Mr Grant, in his recollection, perhaps was being somewhat generous. Uh, it, it took over uh, a year for that adjudication to arise. Uh, as I understand it, a claim was issued, a legal claim was issued in October of 1997, which resulted somewhat more speedily in the judgment that he refers to in paragraph 14 being given in his favour in December, only some two months later. All right. Thank you. And then can I move on, secondly, to the injunction Mr J referred to uh, the police and the report uh, to the police and the decision to follow a civil course instead, or at least in the first instance. Can I just remind uh, you, sir, that the incident relating to the paparazzo who was trying to run over uh, Mr. Grant's baby's grandmother took place on Thursday the 10th of November, and I applied the next day for an emergency injunction on Friday the 11th of November, which was granted by Mr Justice Tugendhat, although his reasons uh, arrived a week later. The purpose, of course, was to immediately bring the campaign to an end, which, as you've just heard, it did uh, with remarkable efficiency. That's all I wanted to say, sir. Yeah. 
And this chronology actually comes out of Mr. Justice Tugendhat's judgment. It does, sir. Which we've got. We do. Thank you very much. We will have ten minutes, or as long as Mr. Grant needs.